for a conversation about inclusive growth and purpose-driven leadership, please welcome award-winning journalist, editor, author, and founder of the Women in the World Summits, Tina Brown, and Ajay Banga, CEO of MasterCard. Hey. Well, it's wonderful to be here for this very first Global Inclusion Conference. What a wonderful thing to be here and sitting here with someone who I do regard as something of a business superhero, Aja Banga, right? During his 10 years, he's led this company's stock price, price into the stratosphere. It's risen over 1,000%, but he's done more than that. And this is what I so much admire about him. He's shown the corporate world, world that doing well by doing good isn't just the latest bromide to brandish around at Davos. It's a wildly successful business strategy that he lives and implements every day. Inside MasterCard, a company run on 100% renewable energy, by the way, he's delivered on pay equity for men and women. He's brought nearly 500 million previously unbanked people into the financial system. And he's founded the Center for Inclusive Growth, one of the, of course, the, well, the co-host really with Aspen today. And last year he committed half a billion dollars to drive financial inclusion and ensure that global citizens everywhere prosper in the digital economy. So great to be sitting with you, Ajay. Again, you, I always love that. Thank you. So if my I, mother were to be introducing me, she'd just say I'm more good looking. That's about <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else has got covered. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got to ask, I mean, the early motivations in your life are interesting to me. I mean, when you graduated from India's business school, you know, top business school. Did you have your sights on, you know, one day running this huge global, uh, you know, co company in the U.S. and no. and and being? What, no. What, what, no. what were your sort of? What did you I think had no about your life clue. at that point? I graduated from business school in 1981. There was no Google. You still use the Encyclopedia Britannica to figure out where anything was, and I had no idea. I kind of my the limits of my vision were dictated by the limits of what I'd been exposed to. And growing up in India in the 70s and 60s, my exposure was what Indian education and history as it was after the independence movement, which was basically aimed at being separate from everybody else and being self-reliant. Those two words were used by Indian politicians very often. In a funny kind of way, they were not very different from the nationalistic movements of today. Mm -hmm just done differently. And uh, I grew up in that, you know, I had no idea that I'd come here. I kind of thought that I would grow up, do things in India, and the limits was I would, I would become, you know, if I joined a public sector organization, I'd grow there. If I joined a private sector organization, I'd grow there. I had no idea mm. what I'd end up doing. Wow. I wanted to be a, a pilot, which I have still no clue how to do. And, <laughs> you know, I hope you never let me get behind an airplane <laughs> thingy anyway. So I, I had no idea, none whatsoever. So here you are, and I understand that when you first arrived in the U.S., you wouldn't, uh, you couldn't get a phone because you didn't have a credit history. That is right? correct. That's such an amazing f detail to me. I mean, did that sort of impact uh, yes. how you know you went about thinking about Mastercard? Yeah, I came here in 2000. That's when we moved, and by then I was a senior middle kind of level executive at Citigroup. I'd been working in London and Brussels, and and of course I'd been in India for 15, 20 years before that with Nestle and Pepsi, and so I thought it wouldn't be that hard to pick up a cell phone. Turned out that when you arrive in the United States, if you don't have a credit history, nobody gives you anything. They don't rent an apartment to you. You can't get a cell phone. And I had to go to an AT&T store and try and obtain a cell phone with a guy who pulled up my social security number and said, you got no credit, I can't give you a phone. And so then I had to give my brokerage statement, which is crazy. I was giving some kid in an AT&T store my entire brokerage statement who looked at it and said, you have too many zeros in this. I said, I'm trying to explain to you <laughs> that I'm not some dumbass guy who's just walked off a boat. And he said, well, you know, you don't have a social, you don't have a credit history. I can't give you a phone. And then he called some manager, faxed this all over. Now this brokerage statement has gone to some other guy whom I don't know. And then finally I get a cell phone. With, and I just remember thinking that this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And considering this is a country of immigrants, where I at least have come at a relatively well-off time in my life. If you'd come earlier, it was obviously tougher. And then I learned that most people who come here get their first card or their first car loan by having a friend or a relative guarantee it for them. Mm -hmm. 
And that makes no sense. We've got to construct a model that makes sense for people yeah. and not one that's built off people who only understand privilege and don't understand the challenge for the other. That's the issue. Well, it is, and, and of course it brings That's me to, to, to what we're all doing here, because, I mean, when did you decide that financial inclusion was such a game-changing factor in reducing inequality? Actually, I had no clue about financial inclusion either. As you can see, I didn't have a clue about many things. But <laughs> financial and inclusion... And I'm beginning to wonder whether I got the right guy sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a guy, I don't know if he's here today. Is Bob and Emily here? There he is. So Bob and Emily used to be my colleague at Citigroup, and I was in uh, London, and Bob was in our treasury of all the things, treasury department, managing emerging markets, risks, and currencies, and uh, which was a very unlikely place to make friends with somebody who would then teach me about financial inclusion. Because we ended up working on securitizing small ticket loans for BRAC, right, Bob? Yeah. The first one, $50 loans. And I had no idea that they could be securitized. I thought you had to have large loans to have a market that would take them off so you could free Brack's balance sheet for lending again. And he taught me that it's possible if you apply your mind and don't take no for an answer. And that started from there, and then we got involved together at Siri for years on financial inclusion. Siri's foundation was funding the effort to do inclusive growth for women with SEVA in India, which was an organization for self-employed women. And one thing led to the other from there, but that is the genesis of how I got involved with financial inclusion. Mm. Well, you've always had this keen sort of sense of what it is to be an outsider. So you've been an insider outsider really sort of all your life. I mean, how much has, you know, your being, you know, a, a Sikh really impacted that? I mean, yeah. coming to the US the, and the, being an outsider really yeah. here. Yeah. Well, most people don't know I'm a Sikh. They all think I'm somebody else who got assassinated some time back in a Pakistani house. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's one of the challenges of being what I look like, yes. But, you know, Tina, you can either struggle against who you are and what you look like, or you can take it for what you are and keep going forward. And I choose to be who I am and go forward with it. And I'm just going to do what I can. And my view is that... Uh, the same thing that sets you apart is also the thing that makes you interesting to people if you're willing to engage with them. And 99.9% .9 of people who live in this country want to engage with you. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to find those 99.9 .9 and talk to them, and then it kind of works out okay. I've never had in my working career in this country ever felt different from anybody else. Mm -hmm. So at work, I, I never, ever, not at Siri, not at MasterCard, not in the meetings I've been, I never feel that anyone looks at me differently. And that gives me a lot of confidence. Well, it's also, you know, your sense of um, confident identity is, is, you know, obviously... You've got to accept it. You've got to accept it. Yeah. Um, and it's wonderful. And I think I'd like to actually... Say that. I love it. Um, so, I think a lot of people... Although I do get stopped randomly at every TSA <laughs> checkpoint. Okay, now we're going to hear the real story, absolutely. <laughs> Since you asked. Yeah. <laughs> But I do think that it also gives you a wonderful ability to sort of understand the outsider point of view. Yes. A lot of people in yes. very successful roles don't have that feeling. Yeah, well, I think that credit history thing stayed with me forever. When Elizabeth Warren was running the CFPB and I went to meet her, the first conversation we had was about thin file credit lending. And I told her what I'd been through and why I understood, therefore, that it was a challenge that needed to be fixed. And while she was at that time trying to figure out how to curb excessive lending, I was trying to tell her that these are two different things. Right. And you cannot deny people the right to be able to borrow money at a reasonable price for what they need just because they didn't have this credit history. Because that credit history system is archaic in itself. The scoring system is backward looking and not forward predictive. And it's built of parameters that were okay 30 years ago, but are unacceptable in today's world. Okay. And I think that's the point in all of these. That gave me an insight. And the fact that I had that chance at Siri to get involved in microfinance uh, also gave me some insights. And you kind of put those two things together. And it, I grew up in a country which was poor. I, I grew up privileged because the son of an army officer, we grew in our own enclosed cocoon. But you could see it all around you. And so I think that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, recently there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the business roundtable you know, mm -hmm. issuing that statement that said that um, 
corporations must value people, not just profits. And I thought, well, yes, of course. I mean, that's what we all want. But, you know, is, is, there, is this just going to be another one of these lip service things that goes, people go around uh, sort of saying this stuff at business conferences, but actually they're living in a different way. And you've always wanted to implement that and have implemented it. But what is your view about, frankly, the ability to make that a really you know, ingrained new shift in business? Well, I think the business roundtable statement is one step in a long journey. It's a way to create a dialogue which shows that companies are now willing to discuss this openly. I think the stresses and pulls of running companies impact everybody, Tina. You gotta make a profit. If you don't make a profit, you don't exist. You have to be competitive, which means your product has to be good, but your pricing has to be good. And for that, you gotta make a margin, which means you gotta manage your costs. And there's no getting away from this. There is no philanthropy in business, right? You've gotta win in your business to see tomorrow morning and to provide employment. I mean, if we employ thousands of people, four times as many people as we had when I joined. And I feel it every day that they make it, that I've made a difference to those people. They've benefited from our share ownership. When I joined, 25, 30 people in the company used to get stock. Today, 70% of the company gets stock every year as part of their compensation. Because the stock has done well, they've made money as for their families. And I feel that every day. So there's no way to step away from that and say somehow companies can wave a magic wand and no longer be profit driven. But you can make profits while also doing things that make sense for the future of your own company. And that really means if you care about the middle class because then they will consume. I mean, look, it's in all our self-interest. If, if the rich make another 100 grand, they're not buying another TV or going out for another five dinners. But if somebody in the middle class makes another 50 grand, they will spend that money on things for their kids, on things for their family, on things for their house. Most of us run companies that survive on people spending money. And therefore, it's in your own self-interest to find a way to spread the peanut butter so that more people can be a part of this society that we all have been lucky enough to grow up in. That's the logic of the BRT mm -hmm. statement. I don't think you should take it out of context from that. It's within that frame that it matters, that there, at least it creates a dialogue. But there's when so it, much stress on CEOs right there now. There is. I mean, with, there it, is. With, from everybody. Yeah, from everybody. I mean, from digital disruption, from yeah. you know, activist shareholders, from I That's mean, right. many CEOs just feel so beleaguered. They feel, well, you know, uh, it's like, who was it who said in fiction, I could be a good woman on 10,000 a year or whatever. Is like, you know, is there a sense that, okay, I'll, go, I'll get to the doing good part when this crazy period of my business being in yeah. turmoil is done? Yeah. Uh, you can take that view, or you can take the view that if you don't do that side by side, there won't be another five years for your company and companies like yours. And so, you know, I was telling someone the other day, you can take all the issues we all deal with in companies and in life in a triangle of three lines. One line is man versus nature, and it's very consciously chosen as man versus nature. We can debate that at another time at Women in the World, but we can talk about that. The second line is long term versus short term. And the third line, is one versus many. If you look at all the problems we talk about, they're either about inclusion, that's the one versus many, they're either about the long term versus short term, which is what you're just mm -hmm. referring to, or they're about climate and man versus nature. Mm -hmm. And we, if we kind of can figure out a way to apply that triangle in your daily life as much as you do at work or at what you write or what you speak of, you'll be mindful of what you're dealing with. And mindfulness is all that that statement is about. Mm -hmm. It's not about dramatically saying, oh, I woke up in the morning and I'm gonna change the way my company runs. It's about being mindful about what you do and how you do it and who you speak to and how you conduct yourself. I think that's what, I would take the BRT statement as a statement of intent by people who care about trying to make a difference because they will be mindful and will do things with that mindfulness. Mm -hmm. We heard from Mike on the platform just now about DQ, which yes. I was extremely um, interested in. Yeah. Uh, and I gather that's your invention, right, DQ? The idea of decency quotient, yes. which is as important as IQ and EQ. Have we lost a decency quotient? I mean, what has been going on that we suddenly have to be so mindful of a decency quotient? I mean, I like to feel that a decency quotient 
is simply something that you know you that's in, ingrained yeah. in us through education we, and through uh, experience. We hadn't lost our brains when we talked about an intelligence quotient, so we haven't lost our decency. I just think it's the mindfulness again. It's. You know, I grew up when IQ was what mattered. You were in school, you had to win in school in India. You did well if you studied well and you got your IQ going. When you went to business school, you started getting taught about EQ and how you had to be able to manage through difficult circumstances and you'd be tested, but testing was part of your growth. And I think when I was trying to explain inside the company of why we were trying to do these things on inclusion and why we were trying to do sort of doing well by doing good and translate that into people understanding what that meant. I found it easier to give people a North Star to go to. And my own North Star is that I want to come to work every day or conduct my life in a way, and I'll make my mistakes by the way. I shout, I get upset, I do all the stuff everybody else does. But I try to let you feel that with me, you will always be safe. Not safe physically, obviously that, but safe. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm sorry, Tina's a friend, so this is, this is, we have our own set of jokes. But, but safe in every which way. Safe that I will always treat you with the respect you deserve because of who you are. Safe that I will give you the space to speak your mind. Safe that I will give you the opportunity to succeed because I'll be the tailwind for you, not the hand in your face. That is DQ. That's decency caution. There's no... There's no miracle, there's no science to it. It's how you conduct yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's the idea. Well, I mean, what are the things that you're proudest of, in a sense, in this philosophy that you've espoused? I mean, you know, you've, you've lived by this lodestar and you've been uh, MasterCard now for over a decade. So wh what have you, where, where, do you where, where do you point to to think, this I tried and this Retirement. Really <laughs> <laughs> right, 10 years is a long time. One day I'll be gone. <laughs> And what your, will you feel your legacy will most be? <laughs> I don't know. Legacy is stuff. When people start talking about legacy, it reminds me of the guys who come to cut you know, ribbons and the buildings are named after them. That normally means they're trying to find a wheelbarrow to take you out in. <laughs> and so, I don't know. I, I, would, I would say this, that I, uh, I deeply care that the culture of the company should embody this DQ inside it. I, we will be a winning company. We, my HR team came up with this idea of saying a winning culture with decency at its core. And I kind of get it. I mean, I, do, I can't say it very well because it doesn't make too much sense to me by itself. It makes sense in pieces, meaning you got to win. Remember I said you got to win. If you don't win, you can't run your business the way we can. But you must have decency at your core. You can't win by standing on somebody else's shoulders and beating their head. Mm -hmm. That to me is not winning. That's just crude schoolyard bullying. And right now we've got a lot of crude schoolyard bullying going on everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I just think we need to refine that decency inside ourselves and start talking about how we can all do this together. Because otherwise it's going to be a hard message. So do, do you feel that this is now really um, <laughs> so true? Some of these guys who are clapping work for me, so don't listen to them. <laughs> So do you feel this is now a, a particularly important time to get the private sector and the public sector to work together? And, and how, what is the best way to do these partnerships? Because they're not easy to do well. Okay, that's a really important question. I, having talked about that 500 million that somebody mentioned, I think Mike mentioned that we were running out 500 million people to be financially included. And we're kind of there. This announcement happened in 2014 at an IMF World Bank meeting, which just kind of concluded the same kind of meeting in 2014. And we said by 2020, we'll find a way to get to 500 million. It's not by ourselves, by the way. It's with partners, banks, telecom companies, governments, NGOs, the whole lot. The one thing I have found the most challenging in that period, the single most challenging, is the absence of trust between the public sector and the private sector. And it's, it's embodied when you go and talk to somebody, they first look at you and say, MasterCard, credit cards. You must be trying to make money out of the bottom of the pyramid. They will all go under because of you. Yeah, well, you know, if you watch Romeo and Juliet, there's this line about what's in a name. Well, Apple doesn't sell bloody apples. <laughs> and Amazon is not a river in Brazil, although it's actually more consequential as a river in Brazil. And yet, we are seen as the credit card giant. We don't 
I can't give you a credit card. Banks issue credit cards. If you ask me to give you a credit card, I got to call friends of mine in a bank and say, could you please give Tina Brown a credit card? And by the way, remember to ask her for a credit history yourself. <laughs> right? Yikes. I, yes, exactly. And so that's the biggest challenge, to make them realize that our technology and our data and our skills can be used because what we are is an infrastructure company. We provide connectivity and networks and rules of play. We don't actually have anything to do with the credit card in your wallet. We, your debit card, your credit card, your prepaid card, on a phone, on your fingerprint, rubbing your forehead, whichever way you want to use it. <laughs> I'll help you use it. But I don't issue it, and I don't determine what you borrow, and I don't determine what you pay for it. I think that is an understanding that we still have to build and add to the trust quotient between us. Sure. And to me, that's the biggest challenge. The problems in the inclusion world are too big for philanthropy alone to solve. You know, we, uh, I don't know if Rita Roy is here from the MasterCard Foundation. She around? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we had our IPO, uh, the owners of the bank, the banks were the owners of our company at that time. They put 12% of the company aside into the foundation. That foundation today, when Rita is the terrific CEO who runs it, she's here somewhere. And Rita is, that foundation is worth close to 25, 30 billion dollars. And it's one of the largest foundations in the world. And they're focused on generating jobs in Africa, 30 million of them over the next decade. And I'm telling you, they'll get it done. Because they know what they're doing, and they've got the resources, and they have the capability, and they've got outstanding people. And that, to me, people don't even understand that. They wonder, there must be a trick in that. We, and that runs independently, by the way. We don't have any influence in them. They run completely separately. We're their only donor, but they run separately. And yet, people will interpret somehow, oh, that must be something to do with MasterCard. It's not. And getting that trust going, even with their money, they can't succeed. What is required, Tina, is for private sector capital, ingenuity, ca and technology to be applied to the ideas, because there isn't enough government money or NGO money in the world to solve for the kind of problems that the SDGs have laid out. If you really want to understand the SDGs, here's the easiest way to understand them. One big goddamn problem, which we got to solve. It's really a big problem. Climate change is a big problem. Inclusion is a big problem. Inequality is a big problem. Women's rights are a big problem. Yeah, they're all big problems. There isn't enough money in the government or the NGO sector. Yeah. You need the private sector and private people to bring their capital, their technology, their ingenuity, their people to the party. Wow. That's really important. No, it's, it's an enormous idea, and, and it's one that you are extraordinarily you know, effective in. You've got this huge foundation, and now we have the uh, Inclusion uh, Center, the Inclusive Growth Center. What is it that you felt this new entity could do that the foundation wasn't doing? Yeah, so the foundation is very focused on Africa as a destination. They've defined their role as generating jobs for young Africans because the, if you look at the profile of age in Africa, that would be the biggest challenge of the next decade or two. So they're very focused in that space. Whereas our company is global, and in fact, Africa is one portion of our business, but our business is in the United States. It's 40% of our revenue comes from the US. 60% comes from outside of the US and we're all over the world. And so we needed to find ways to engage, one, a broader category than generating jobs, because we felt our technology can be helpful in inclusion, not just for jobs, but getting people into the financial world and then giving them a chance to get access to insurance, credits, savings at a reasonable price. That's what we're trying to get them to go from uh, being included to actually having the benefits of that inclusion be visible to them in their lives. It could be a small micro-entrepreneur who's got a shop outside her home in Uganda, and she's got to get credit, and that's what we're trying to do with Unilever. Or it could be a person in a village who cannot get access to electricity because the grid is too expensive to bring there, but working with MCOPA, a company there, we can bring them solar systems which can be activated to pay for what you can afford for the day by using a QR code and a phone. Or it could be how you pay for your kid's education. You can't afford to pay the bill in one day in a month, but you could pay one day every week. And if you know schools don't run installment plans, mm -hmm. well, we can manage those for you. Just 
divide the thing by four and let the pay and in the process the kid can go to school but by the way an interesting way the government can can manage whether the teachers are showing up or not because they are the ones entering the information about who's paying so there are many ways to use your technology which is basically a network connectivity capability and use it with current digital tools to enable people who otherwise were not there that's what the Center for Inclusive Growth is trying to do is to create those conversations, empower those organizations. We're not going to do it ourselves. We've got a great partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation. I don't know if Rajiv is around, but Raj Shah was here somewhere. I met him a little while ago, and that's part of what we're trying to do, just empower others well, to do it. One, one, in one sentence, what would you like everybody in this room to take away in terms of what they can do? They have, we have a lot of very uh, you know, influential people in the room. What do you want to see happen after today? Be really aware that the partnership between the private sector and the public sector will only change if we trust each other. And we need to find a way to make those partnership ideas come to life. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. I love what you said about trust. You're so right.